Hmm. We can get this thing to work. Hey everybody, I'm glad you're joining us live today here on Facebook. I hope you're all doing well. I have it going on my phone as well so I can read your comments because uh, the video is really hard to keep up with um, with what we got going on here. But I wanted to get in touch with you and give you an update for El Salvador. Thank you for being patient with me as um, last week we just got back at Tuesday about 3 a.m. in the morning. So I wanted to go ahead and uh, rest last week and just recover. And then I was blessed to spend time at a unplanned retreat this weekend where I got to uh, just listen and be ministered to by Jack Coe's daughter. Uh, if you don't know who Jack Coe is, he was a healing evangelist that did the largest tent meetings in the 40s and 50s. But that was such a blessing to just be in those meetings to get refreshed after being, you know, pouring out for seven days in El Salvador. And I just want to thank everybody who sewed into the trip. First of all, if you don't know who I am, my name is Christine Morgan. I'm the founder of Worldwide Evangelistic Ministry. And uh, we started just, you know, about eight years ago uh, in part-time ministry. And this year just stepped into full-time ministry. And God has been opening doors uh, like you wouldn't believe. And so we're so blessed at what God is doing. Uh, in the nations, in the ministry, through the partners. Uh, hey, Terry, great to see you on here. Denise from Texas, great to see you on here. Uh, we're going to be sharing about all that God did in El Salvador, just updating you. Um, if you. If you see me look down, it's because I'm looking at my phone to read the comments because when we stream on Facebook, it's kind of hard to tell uh, who's on here and what they're commenting but we want to go ahead and give you an update about El Salvador. Uh, if you don't know, this was our first team trip. Hi, Aunt Joyce. Great to see you on here. Glad that uh, you can join us. This was our first team trip and our first uh, crusade we've ever done. And so I'm so happy to see where God is taking us. And I know we're just scratching the surface of what God's doing. But for all of you that sewed into this trip to El Salvador, into our first crusade, our first team trip, I want to say thank you. Without your partnership, without your prayers, we couldn't do what we've been doing. And God has continued to advance and open doors for us. So before I went to uh, El Salvador, uh, I had been praying even by the end of March, just asking the Lord what he wanted to do in El Salvador, and really I felt like the Lord was saying, light the people on fire. Um, over these past few months, we've really stepped into something in the anointing by way of seeing the fire and the power of God released, even over Zoom, when we've been preaching in Pakistan. I felt just a strong anointing and an increase of the fire. So anybody that's watching right now or will watch the replay, uh, share with your friends that are mission-minded. Share with the people that had been praying about this trip in El Salvador uh, that kept us in prayer. I know a lot of you prayed, and I want to say thank you uh, for praying. Thank you for being part of what God did. You know, some people say, well, I'm not able to sow financially, but if you prayed, you also gave into this trip. Prayer really sustained us. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But as I said, this was the first time we did a crusade, put our faith out there uh, just to believe God to put on this crusade because God's heart is people. God's heart is saving souls. And so the focus of the ministry is always to preach the uncompromising gospel and reach people uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then to lead them into an encounter where they can have a personal experience, a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. And I believe that if we can get people to realize and know who Jesus is, they'll have an encounter of power by the Holy Spirit that will cause uh, life transformation. 
We saw it over and over again on this trip that people who encountered the fire of God, the love of God, and the power of God were just undone by his presence. And I believe that we're going to see great transformation in El Salvador. One of the things that, uh, you know, God gave me a scripture for this trip, 2 Corinthians 3.18. So I want to read it to you. It says, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. So that was our theme scripture for this crusade and for this trip is that people would be transformed by the glory of the Lord, that we would move in such a way where we were, the team would be led by the spirit, move in the prophetic and see the power of God touch and change lives, churches, communities. Uh, we had such governmental favor and political favor on this trip that it was it was insane because it was only God. And as God continues to open up the nations, and I believe we're going to see countries unfold before us in the coming months. If you don't know, we're headed to South Korea, July 16th through August 1st. I'm going there with Bernie Scheidler and Taryn Yancey. We've been asked to do two different women's conferences there. Hey, Eric, great to see you. Eric was on the trip. Eric did a phenomenal job. I got to know Eric for the first time, really, even though we were in Malawi together last year. This is the first time getting to know Eric, and he moves with a heart of compassion and just love uh, through a conversion, which God just transformed his life. So, um, so like I was saying, uh, the doors are opening to the nations, and I believe this next team trip, we're going to have, uh, I'm going to open it up for 30 people, and uh, we're going to, we're looking at Colombia right now, and of course, El Salvador has wide open doors, uh, inv invitations to go back and work with the government and leadership, and so next time we go to El Salvador, we want to do a crusade either in a stadium and bus people in, or we're going to go into the heart of one of the poorest of the poor places, Montreal, and just do a crusade right there uh, in that city so people can just uh, walk out their front doors, down the street, and into the crusade grounds. So that's what we're looking for next time we go to El Salvador. Uh, you know, when we got to El Salvador, I took a team of six, and uh, the first night we got there, we met with uh, one of the president's right-hand mans in the spiritual advising department, uh, and he was telling us, you know, he just greeted us and thanked us for coming to El Salvador, and he said he really believed the time was right for all that God was doing in El Salvador, and uh, he said recently they had... Uh, at one of the largest stadiums in the city, I saw it when we came in, they had a big concert music festival there, but basically it was a satanic festival. Uh, and so the country was, you know, whether they knew it or not, through that satanic festival, they were opening a door for the demonic and the satanic and saying, hey, El Salvador is open to the things of the devil. But, you know, I believe that we came in at the right time that God sent the team there to preach the gospel in this Catholic Orthodox majority country and just say, it's time to take El Salvador back for Jesus. It's time to take a stand and it's time for a move of God. And so really the first night we were there, uh, I myself and the other ladies were praying. The guys were still coming in from the airport and we were praying and we kind of all confirmed what we were sensing in the spirit while we were praying is that, God was striking the land with a staff. And as he struck the land, that the ground began to crack. And then that a rippling effect will begin to go outward. So what we believe this means is God was striking the ground and creating a spark of revival that was going to go not only through El Salvador, but reach other parts of South America. And I'll tell you, uh, some exciting things about how I believe that went forth uh, through radio and television, uh, just with the favor we've had. Um, so, you know, we we were saying it's time to take a stand. It's time to take back El Salvador. It's time for a move of God. 
And so every time we preached the gospel, we made sure that every person who knew about Jesus, but maybe they go to a, a Catholic church, we wanted to make sure they knew that we serve a living Jesus, that Jesus is no longer hanging on the cross, that he has resurrected from the dead and took the keys to death, hell, and the grave, and so that he overcame, and that they no longer had to go to a priest to pray, to ask forgiveness of sins, but forgiveness of sins came through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that the veil was torn in two from heaven down, and so that we as believers, Jesus now lives on the inside of us, and that they could pray to Jesus, and Jesus uh, will give them forgiveness of sins through the shedding of his blood. And that's important to know because that's biblical theology. So when we preach, we don't want to just preach and then uh, have people still walking in their own way. We want to preach the Bible. We want to preach truth. And so that people can understand that Jesus is no longer on a cross. We don't do idol worship, but we speak the truth so that that way they can be free. The Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So that's what we want to do. So we kicked it off. Uh, we got there on a Monday night. We kicked it off on Tuesday going to uh, the largest TV station in El Salvador, which would be equivalent to Good Morning America here in the U.S. And so the team was greeted and welcomed. Uh, I got to speak about and be interviewed about why we were there, what we were doing with the crusade. And then I got to talk about the gospel and that we were going to be praying for the sick and expecting miracles, signs and wonders, blind eyes opening, deaf ears opening, uh, people coming out of wheelchairs. And I'll share those testimonies later, but I want to kind of go in line so you kind of get a full idea of just some of the stuff that uh, you partnered with, you gave, you prayed into. Um, hey, Denise, great to see you on here. My sister from Texas, she's always supporting and encouraging, I love her. And I'm gonna be in Texas on June 27th through July 7th. So I'm gonna have a great time in Texas. If you're watching from Texas and you wanna get together, I will be in Texas June 27th through July 1st. Uh, so reach out to me um, as my schedule fills up fast and I want to have time with family, but I want to meet with partners as well. And so when we went on the TV station, we got an opportunity to just talk about Jesus. They interviewed us and we just boldly declared that they, we were there to preach the gospel of Jesus without compromise that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so this was a great opportunity because so many people in El Salvador were watching this as it was going nationwide. Um, and they gave out information on where the crusade would be. And then after that, we headed over to a women's prison where the women who have children from zero to six years of age can live in the prison with them. And then either they go to family members or they go into an orphanage and then the mothers are sent to a more secure uh, hardcore facility. We were told that uh, these women, there was about 30 kids in there and uh, these women are hardcore women. So I talked to one lady, she was five years into a 15 year sentence and she had this little baby that was maybe six months old. So the women in there, they were, um, you know, they were only allowed in this facility because they had children. Otherwise, they'd be in a, a lockdown facility and wouldn't have rights to see their children. Uh, but this was an opportunity where we just got to go in and preach God's love. Several uh, team members shared either testimonies or words of encouragement. And then I went ahead and shared a short gospel message. Uh, we handed out candy and stickers to the kids. And then through uh, some of your giving, we had two partners uh, come forth and say they wanted to pray, pay for the trampoline for the little kids. And so we got that uh, kind of set up and showed the little kids. The little kids had no idea how to jump on a trampoline. And so, you know, after we prayed for all the kids and we got to hold some babies and uh, just interact with them, we, we showed our 14 year old on the trip, Sophia, got on the trampoline. She's the smallest and lightest weight one. 
and had to show the little kids how to kind of jump on the trampoline. And once they figured it out, they were so excited and their, their faces were just beaming as they jumped up and down. And, uh, you know, Eric helped put that trampoline together, uh, you know, but thank you to the partners they gave into that special project. Uh, you know, you think all little kids know how to jump on a trampoline, but, you know, we had to show them and they were just so excited. And the staff was excited that we were there and just blessing the people. And so it was really great. And then the, you know, on a, that was Tuesday on Wednesday, um, you know, we went on TV on Tuesday on Wednesday, uh, apparently the largest, one of the largest radio stations, the largest Christian station in El Salvador that reaches about 7 billion people because it goes into other countries. Uh, they they hunted us down and requested that we would come and uh, be on the air and talk about what God is saying to El Salvador. What is God saying in this moment? Uh, we got to give like a prophetic word. And then we talked about the crusade and what was going on. And so uh, the station manager was the one actually interviewing me. And so the team got to stay outside and they prayed for some of the staff. But while we were talking about what the word of the Lord is for El Salvador, the station manager was saying that he felt the presence of God and the power of God and that he thought the message that we were talking about needed to get out. And so he he just said right then and there that on Saturday night, you know, they were just going to throw the rest of the broadcast programs out the window and they were going to be at the park uh, airing the crusade live across the airways into multiple countries and so like i said they had a seven billion person reach and so this is all god you know we were talking about how god has opened doors god has given favor uh god really had a governmental mantle and anointing on this trip uh you know because i asked the translator and the coordinator if everyone who comes there if they get these kind of doors and they get to do these kind of things and they said no and I don't say that to boast of myself, but I want you to know that you are partnering with what God was governmentally in the kingdom doing in El Salvador. So what you did had a great impact, a great influence. And so I believe we're going to see this impact for generations to come of people that were touched. I knew this wouldn't be the last trip we do to El Salvador. Basically, someone joked with us and said, you become the mother of El Salvador because they were, getting, they were getting so many calls uh, into the radio station. We got to pray for the sick over the radio. We just got to uh, say what we were going to be doing and that people were going to be healed. And we just said, hey, put your hands on wherever you need healing. And then we preached over the airways. Hey, Maritza, great to see you on here. Maritza uh, did a great job on the team. She actually had spoke Spanish, but uh Kind of pushed her out of her comfort zone a little there and had her doing some translating here and there uh, while we ministered to people, while we were on the street. So she acted as a bonus translator, but I know it was a stretch for her to get out there and do that. But God has amazing things for Maritza, and she did an awesome job. It was a blessing to have her on the team. And so after we went to the radio station, uh, you know, and did that, we just, uh, you know, prayed for the station manager. He had an eye problem. We prayed for his wife. And, uh, you know, it's just, like I said, amazing that they would say, even though we have regular programming on Saturday, we're going to block out that time. We're going to cut off all that stuff, and we're going to broadcast live from the crusade so that word can go out that, the, that what God is saying for the nation is true and that, we want to see El Salvador change. We wanted the people on the radio to get a hold of this. We want revival. We want God to move in our country. And I tell you, the people of El Salvador are hungry for a move of God. I think they've been praying for years. They've been crying out to God. And I really believe that this was a spark that's going to light revival fires. And so I'm so looking forward to whenever we go to El Salvador next, we're going to team up with the government and like I said, we're either going to do a stadium uh, crusade and bust people in. And I've already been looking. I, I knew before we went that we're going to have such favor that the government will work with us and give us a stadium, uh, I believe, for free. And that pastors would partner with us and so that we would be able to do 
a crusade at a stadium uh, in El Salvador for free. And the government has opened up their arms. They're saying, we want you to come back. We want to work with you. Uh, we want to see God move in our country. And so that is God's favor. That is nothing uh, Christine Morgan can do. That is nothing the team members can do. We give Jesus all the glory because he's helping us partner with these people. And I already had my eyes on the stadium where they had that satanic festival that uh, Dr. Cardoza was telling us about. And I'm believing whether it's the next trip or a future trip, we're going to have a crusade in that stadium. And then uh, God's going to just blow El Salvador up for him. He's going to light them on fire. So we we prayed everywhere. Like I told, if you didn't hear in the beginning, God told me at the end of March, the focus of this crusade was to light the people on fire. And, you know, the translator was telling me that the people needed encouragement. And I said, they'll get that. But if we can get them in an encounter, a power encounter with Jesus Christ, it's going to do more than just an encouraging word, an encouraging message. And I want to thank Taryn Yancey for stepping up. Uh, I stretched her a little bit, but she was my second preacher. Uh, Taryn did a fantastic job. Uh, you know, the Lord stretched her as well in some areas. And uh, But every service and every place that we went, we prayed for people and we saw the power of God fall. We saw the fire fall. People were shaking. They were crying. And so it wasn't just we gave them a good message. No, we gave them a revelatory message, a now word fresh from the Lord, because that's what I want to give. I want to give people a now word that's fresh from the Lord so that when they hear it, it transforms and activates something in their life to push them and empower them to be able to reach their country, their neighborhoods, their family with the gospel. And so after we went to the TV station, uh, you know, we went to the police headquarters and kind of got a small tour there, but we met the head woman chaplain of uh, the police, all the police. She's a woman. And uh, we spoke to a hundred top female sergeants and lieutenants in the police department. Uh, you know, at first the translator thought we might have to be kind of conservative, but then when this one woman got up to sing, this, this one woman, she, I mean, her voice was anointed, but you could feel when she sang that it was like everything within her. And she had this passionate love for Jesus and this reverence. And it just opened up the meeting. And then she began to speak. The translator turned to me and said, we can preach in this place. And so what we thought was going to have to be like a politically calm leadership meeting turned into preaching and the Lord just had me preaching on how Paul said I am apprehended that God apprehended me for this thing and so I said you know your life has been apprehended for a purpose and God has a plan for you not only that you walk in leadership and and influence but that you're changing uh the community that you're working in and you're on the front lines and that God is moving and working with you. Hey, Sean, great to see you on here. Uh, friend Sean, my fellow foodie. Uh, we're going to go eat some barbecue at some point and get some milkshakes at a new creamery I heard about, but Sean is awesome. And uh, But so when we went into the police station, we just I just began to preach about how they've been given authority and have purpose, and then how you even younger women in El Salvador looking up to them because it was a privilege to get to speak into, there's a lot of men on the force, but to speak into the top female lieutenants and sergeants, I believe God was strategically placing the team and I there to speak into their lives, to touch their lives so that they could influence the upcoming generation of women leaders. I think it's no mistake that we encountered a woman mayor a woman uh, head police chaplain, a top uh, lieutenants and sergeants. There were even SWAT team members there. And so we just preached and you could see a lot of women were being touched by the message. Some were even crying. And so we began to just go out and we asked whoever wanted to get prayer come up. 
and I had the team pray for them. But then I started going out into the, the audience and praying for people. I prayed for that woman who sang. Uh, and, you know, the Lord began to give words of knowledge. And you could tell every time, everywhere we went, and we were moving heavy in words of knowledge and in the prophetic gifting. And so whenever I began to speak a prophetic word to someone, they were able to, uh, it penetrated their heart and it pierced their heart. And the way you can tell you have a Holy Spirit directed word is because you can see it penetrate the person and their eyes begin to well up and they were crying. And so, you know, what we're saying to the people isn't just some random word, some encouraging word that we told everyone. It's God specific to their talent, to their anointing, to their situation. And so when God began to speak words of life, these women begin to break because as I said, they're lieutenants, they're sergeants, they got to be tough. They got to look tough in front of the guys. They got to be tough on the streets. But, at, you know, they kind of had like this wall, but there was a point where the wall broke. And then the women just started receiving all across the room uh, words of knowledge as the team went forth with translators. Uh, you know, I was able to pray over the SWAT officers, give them uh you know, phenomenal words of knowledge and even some prophecy. And there was one woman and I just began to tell her that her dream and her desire was to lead a team. And in El Salvador and in the police, they don't do that. You know, women don't do that. But I told her, I said, your family's even told you not to reach for that dream, that it's impossible, that it'll never happen. And she just began to cry. And I just told her, but I see her leading a team. And so I really know that God had that for her to encourage her. And so as we were encouraging these officers, they're going to go back into the field, back into the community where they're dealing with women and young girls on a daily basis. And they'll be able to influence and speak into their community, speak into other police officers. But it was amazing just to see the words of knowledge and prophetic words that were coming out that, you know, you could see it really penetrate and break these ladies' hearts and um, just to empower them and to encourage them. And Taryn and Maritza got to uh, lead, I think, two people to the Lord. Uh, the message was more on uh, having a life of purpose. And I didn't give an altar call in this meeting because that's not the way the Lord directed it. And then Taryn and Maritza were able to go out and pray for people and talk to people. And there was this one lady who was an atheist and she didn't believe in God. And Taryn was able, Taryn told me she was able to tell this uh, woman how, you know, before she got saved, she hated God and how she came out of a life of just uh, witchcraft and, you know, all these kind of things. And the woman gave her life to Jesus. Why? Because Taryn had a testimony that maybe I couldn't reach her with what I said and with what I preach, but Taryn one-on-one -on -one was able to share her experience and lead two police officers to the Lord. And I know Maritza was helping her translate. And so, so many of the team members were touched because one of the things we were doing on this trip and with team members was mentoring them and empowering them to move in uh words of knowledge to move in power to learn how to release the fire uh and you know they can tell you more about that but i strategically wanted to empower the people on this trip because i know a lot of times we can go on trips and the main person is speaking the main person is uh giving the details but I wanted them to not just see me ministering, see me preaching, see me praying for people, but I wanted to get out there with them. And so I took turns with some of them, and then I uh, teamed some of them up with Taryn uh, so we could learn from each other because I can learn from the team members. You know, we're all equalized in Jesus that, you know, not one is spiritually higher than the other. We may walk in different realms of authority, different realms of gifting and maturity, but I wanted to glean off Taryn. I wanted to glean off, you know, how Steve operated, how Eric operated, 
you know, Abby learned, Sophia's 14. We had her come on the trip because she's got a strong call and we wanted her to, you know, learn how to move in the prophetic and by the spirit at an early age. That way she's going to, by the time she's 18, she's going to be a powerhouse. And then Maritza's coming up in ministry as well. And so I've been keeping up with Maritza since I met her in, um, when we went to Malawi in um, April 2020, no, 2021, we were in Malawi together on a team of 38. So I met a lot of these people in Malawi, but I want to foster the call of God on their life. I want to see them become mature. And so I'm at a, at a place in my life now where I've done uh, trips where I preach every service. You know, I was on one trip to Myanmar where I preached 14 services in nine days. And so I've been the main preacher. I've been the one praying for like hundreds of people. And so every on this trip, I made sure. Hey, Yasina, great to see you from Guatemala. You're watching us all the way from Guatemala. That's amazing. Uh, I met Yasina when I went to Guatemala in 2018. Her and her husband have a TV station there and a ministry. They're reaching so many people with the gospel, but it's great to see you on here. So when we take teams, my my goal is not just to take uh, a team, just to say we took a team, but I want to get them out there doing street ministry. I want them to move in words and knowledge. I want them to personally see fire and power released through them um, so that when they're, they leave the trip, not only do they know that they had a part, that they prayed for people, but that they change the lives of people in El Salvador and they're learning to move and grow and how to the giftings and the operation of the Holy Spirit. So if you were to come on a team with us in the future, we're not just going to have you sitting in the audience watching me or another person preach. We're actually going to be activating you and stirring those gifts and we're going to be putting like a mandate and a pull on you to step out of your comfort zone to pray for the sick and see them healed. We believe that when you come on these trips, the things that I walk in, you'll begin to start to walk in as seeing the blind eyes open, the deaf ears here. You're going to begin to see, uh, you know, we were out doing street ministry one day. I was out with Stephen Ficus, and we were outside by where the crusade park was. And there were so many people walking by, buses, traffic. It was crazy. We couldn't even cross the street. We had to have our police escort stop traffic because it was kind of like one of those European roundabouts uh, for traffic. And so we started going out and people were like in a hurry to get uh, to places to eat, uh, get back to work. And so what we ended up doing is we stayed in about, a, you know, a 12 foot range, maybe a little more, maybe like 12 to 20 feet of a bus stop because you know, people couldn't run away because they were waiting on their bus and they didn't want to miss their bus. But in like that 12 feet, I personally prayed for like five people who had vision problems, who couldn't see out of their eye. Um, that it, They had a cataract covering their eye and were scheduled for surgery. This one older woman had, uh, it was her left eye. She couldn't see out of, it was completely fuzzy. And, um, so I, she had scheduled for surgery, and I said, so if I prayed for you, you would be able to tell if your eye was being healed, if there was a difference in your vision, and she said yes, and so, you know, Steve was there, I started praying for her eye, I rebuked the spirit of blindness and commanded her eye to come into alignment, and uh, just the disease and sickness had come off her body, and as I had her cover her good eye afterwards, and I tested her her vision, she said she could see. And I was holding up, I was probably had my hand like uh, maybe like one to two feet away from her. And I held up two fingers and she held up two fingers and I held up my finger over here and she she was able to see. And so it was awesome to see God just touching people right there on the street at the bus stop, uh, prayed for a lady, back pain instantly gone. Uh, we saw the trauma. We saw what was afflicting her. And as we prayed, back pain came off it. Her knees, she was able to start bending her knees. Uh, she actually went and got her daughter and came back and had us pray for her daughter. Steve prayed for her, uh, for her to be healed of asthma. And then 
as he was praying, I got a word of knowledge about she had blurry vision and the mom said yes. So we had Steve add that to um, his prayer and her vision was improving. Her breathing was improving. We saw people uh, just, you know, even the lady with the back pain, as I was praying for, I had a word of knowledge about uh, her lungs. And as I was praying, I felt something come off her. Like it was coming off her lungs as I was praying. And um, so God began to heal her. And so I asked her if she had a problem with her lungs or how she felt. And she was saying that she felt like something left her body. There was like a, um, a light weightness. And then just the team, you know, the teams were going out and I don't know everything about what the other teams did, but Steve and I, you know, we went up and we talked to some homeless guys and they were saying, uh, you know, some people from our team had already been there and prayed for them, but there was this American guy, his mom uh, was from El Salvador and he was saying how he hurt his ankle. He had a skateboard. His name was Carlos. Uh, Steve was asking if he could pray for him and he was trying to get out of there. Uh, you know, and he didn't want anybody laying hands on him. And I said, well, what if God could heal your ankle? And we prayed from here without even touching you. I said, would you be open to that? And he said, yes. So Steve went ahead and prayed and I just joined in agreement uh, with that prayer. And he commanded that foot to be healed for pain to leave. And you should have seen this guy, Carlos, his face. He was so shocked. Uh, after Steve prayed and after I prayed, he was so shocked. Hey, Aunt Susie. Hey, Megan. Great to see y'all on here talking about El Salvador. So Steve prays for Carlos. We don't even touch his ankle. And he is so amazed that the Lord would touch his ankle and heal his ankle that he just starts cussing and getting like really excited. You know, so he went from don't pray for me, don't touch me to uh, getting so excited and so I told him, well, let's see, let's, I know you got to leave, but let's see you skate away. And he went over and he said he was going to do this jump off this platform. Uh, and so he did it and he came by and he said, hey, you know, it's better. And so, you know, God was touching people and wants to show people that it's not us praying for them. It's not us healing them, but it's the Lord healing them because Jesus can heal them and we don't even have to touch them. He can heal just at a word. And so that was pretty awesome just to see him like totally freaking out. And, you know, we had a lot of skateboarders in the park. Uh, we went to the park Monday night. Well, Tuesday night, actually. Uh, and just, uh, you know, did some street ministry. And we're talking to a lot of skateboarders. And so it was great to see them come out to the crusade, too. And so we did, you know, street ministry and one of the things that was really interesting that Steve didn't even notice, you know, I'm talking about, you know, flowing in words of knowledge and people that come on these teams moving in the prophetic and revelation uh, and seeing people healed is this, there was this one guy and he was just talking, talking, talking. And I said, okay, either you want prayer or you don't. So Steve, you know, I was like, we're going to leave, um, you know, cause some people, they just want to talk the whole time. So Steve began to, uh, pray for him and as he you know he had a medical condition like there was something wrong with his wrist and his legs and he had had surgery and as if steve's a uh nick you uh transportation nurse so he's dealt with a lot of trauma he works in the medical field uh and so when this guy said he wanted prayer i was like steve go ahead and pray for him and so as steve began to pray steve didn't even realize till later when i mentioned it to him he mentioned a specific disease. It was, it was a disease that had two names and it was hyphenated in the middle. And he just called that disease out by name. And uh, when I heard it, I was like, wow, because I've heard this before in a commercial for uh, a prescription drug. And so Steve later, I, I was telling someone, Steve even knew the medical terminology. And Steve was like, wait, what? I don't even remember saying that. And so that just shows you, you know, how when you're yielded to the spirit and you begin to pray and we don't pray with our own understanding, but we pray in uh, the knowledge of the Holy Spirit and the leading of the Holy Spirit that he'll show us and reveal things to us uh, that people are dealing with, whether it's a word of knowledge, whether it's a sickness or disease, 
Uh, and so that was just awesome. I was just like, God is so cool that when Steve prayed, he God used the exact terminology, but that Steve was so yielded that that even came out and he didn't even realize what he said. And so then on Saturday, we did have, you know, because we had so many political things going on on Friday, we got to, uh, after we um, went to speak at the Department of Agriculture, uh, this was an interesting uh, event that they requested, the Minister of Agriculture requested that we come and speak to his people uh, because they were, the HR guy said they were having a lot of problems with communication with, uh, you know, new managers that came in thinking they were better than the people that had been there. And it created a lot of friction and a lot of dysfunction. And so the team and I went there, they said, absolutely no scripture. You can't go like Pentecostal, charismatic, yelling hallelujah, shout out, 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 praying in tongues. They, you know, they, they did that. It was kind of funny the way they did it, but they did it to emphasize that you know, we were kind of going in low key. And so when I got back to the hotel the night before, uh, the Lord just gave me a message and downloaded a message to me. And it had like 10 points of like leadership and communication and uh, respect. And so, you know, I just went, the team did a great job. And uh, we just spoke to about 30 top managers and a VP of the Department of Agriculture. And so we were able to just speak into their lives. And I began to talk about how you relate to people, how you communicate body language, uh, respecting one another, and how when we talk about things, sometimes we think other people understand us or how we're not encouraging our employees. We just focus on the negative and what they do wrong. And so by the time that was finished, uh, they asked for question and answers. And instead of question and answer, we had people stand up and tell us that they've never heard a uh, management or leadership message quite like that. And it really spoke to them and how they wanted to implement it into their departments and practice it. Otherwise, they would lose the effectiveness. And one man even got up. And he was an older gentleman and he he was talking about he's traveled to different countries because, you know, he's in management. He's been in leadership training, management seminars. And he was saying that there, he didn't know why, but this message was different. And there was something about it, you know, and Eric was saying that the message, whether or not we spoke scripture and it's true, the anointing that's on my life was still on the word, still coming through my voice. And so it was having an impact as it would penetrate their hearts. They thought they were just getting a good lecture, but the Lord and his spirit were moving on these words because God gave me this specific message. And so, um, you know, the guy that invited us, thanked us. Uh, the translator was saying it was such a good message that he was needing the notes and I tell you, it was all God inspired. We didn't use one scripture. We, you know, the only time we talked about God was at the end when they asked what we were doing there uh, in El Salvador. And I said, we were having a crusade. We were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We were going to pray for the sick and the lame, the deaf uh, in the name of Jesus and expect healing miracles, notable miracles, signs and wonders, and invited them out, told them we had gone into the other communities, prayed for people, uh, and just did like outreaches. Uh, we did a school outreach where we went in, they had 400 students. Uh, we got to preach the gospel message. And when it came time to ask them if they wanted to invite Jesus into their hearts, so many people so many of the kids raised their hands and some of the little kids just raised their hands because they, you know, other people were raising their hands, but we asked them all to repeat, you know, the sinner's prayer. And I made sure, like I said earlier, if you didn't weren't on the live, I said, because they're Catholic Orthodox, I made sure they understood that Jesus was no longer on the cross, that he ripped the veil in two 
that they could no longer had to go to a priest to find forgiveness of sins, but forgiveness of sins came through Jesus Christ and how they were covered with his blood and how Jesus lived on the inside of them now. So a lot, you know, we go, you see in a lot of Roman uh, Catholic or Catholic Orthodox, uh, they always, they have uh, Jesus on the cross, whether it's rosaries, whether it's on the wall. So we want them to know that Jesus is not dead. He's not on the cross, but he's risen and sitting at the right hand of the father. He's ruling and reigning. He lives inside of them. And so then we had an opportunity. I said, if anyone wants prayer for something specific, we want to pray for you. And so they said, my translator said, well, they had a whole program scheduled. So I said, later, come find one of us in these uh, team shirts. And actually, the principal stepped up and said, we're going to put the whole program on hold. And we want you to pray for the kids right now. And so the kids that wanted prayer got in circles with their teachers. And so we released the team to just go pray and prophesy over these kids and what would have been like a quick, you know, because there's probably like 100, 200 kids out there who wanted prayer out of the 400. And so, you know, they begin to go with the translators and start prophesying and praying over the kids. And I started praying over some of the teachers. So it was a phenomenal time. And then to those of you that sewed into the food packets, uh, we gave each student, you know, the, the principal had to pass them out because it would have been chaotic, but we wanted to make sure that each student went home with uh, just the necessities that would feed a family, their family for a week. And so if you gave into that project, I want to say thank you. If you sewed into this trip, you were part of that project and feeding these people, you know, getting the gospel out. I always say on these trips, we don't just bring spiritual food and say, Jesus cares about your every need. And then they're starving. This There was two communities where they were the poorest of the poor. And we went into one of, one of the communities. We focused on that community and we got enough food to feed the 250 families that live in this community for a week. So that was really something awesome. And then, of course, I know everybody wants to hear about the crusade. We're finally at that point, uh, you know. The team did prayer and I just got in God's presence for about three hours, you know, before the crusade, uh, an additional three hours and just basked in him, rested in him, sought the Lord's heart. And the team was praying in another room. I appreciate Karen for leading that uh, prayer. And so we went in there and kind of just prayed over the team members before we left, uh, got some words of knowledge and even some prophetic words. Uh, and so then we went to the crusade and, you know, our, our aim was about two, two to 5,000 for the crusade. Um, and we had a pastor come forward, if you don't know, in the beginning, and he paid for half the crusade. And so, you know, that was almost unheard of. And so uh, my ministry paid for half. And then there were some extra expenses like bathrooms, porta potty advertising, uh, so if you gave into that, you're going to have a lasting impact in the kingdom of God for souls won, for people healed. You never even went to El Salvador, but you were there in spirit and God used you in a mighty way that uh, you were able to do great things. Uh, so we got to the crusade grounds. They had set it up. Uh, there was no mistake that we were supposed to be here. This park we were in, they said you had to pay for it and have six months, you know, re reserve it six months ahead of time. We reserved it about four weeks out and they charged us nothing to have an event in this park. And the park's name just happened to be Savior of the World. And so come on, in the middle of this park, there was a statue and it was kind of like a monument. And then it had a big globe of the world and Jesus standing on top of it. I'll have to show a picture uh, it's pretty amazing. So I know that God purposed us to be in that park and uh, preaching at the Savior of the world and declaring in this dark place, in this community, in this region, in this country, that Jesus was the Savior of the world. And so we aimed for, like I said, two to 5,000 people. We had a couple hundred show up there. Uh, so if in the natural you might think, oh, well, we failed at a crusade. Guys, this was our first ever crusade. 
And we rocked it because we were putting a stake in the ground, taking a stand for Jesus in this country, making a statement that all would see. We weren't off the road at some little, you know, park where nobody goes or, you know, hidden behind buildings. But we were smack dab in the heart of San Salvador preaching the gospel message. And the team member said the sound system was bouncing off the buildings. And so they know that people that weren't even in the vicinity were hearing it beyond the park, beyond that, the restaurant. And so we, you know, we know there were skaters and homeless people. We had a lot of uh, some pastors showing up. But though our numbers were projected higher, uh, we had we had a politician that was going to rent some buses and ended up not renting them. But it doesn't matter because we were faithful to do what God said. We were staking a claim. And I know that because of what we did, we were working with that governmental authority. A governmental spiritual shift started to happen in El Salvador as we were there preaching the gospel. Man, I feel the Holy Spirit right now. And the fire just coming on me as I'm talking about this. But because we took a stand and we said, God wants to take back El Salvador for Jesus Christ. God began to move in that city. And we believe, like I said earlier, that he hit the ground with a staff and it cracked the ground. And then it, like a rippling effect, it would go throughout El Salvador and begin to spread into South America. And I really believe South America is going to open to us. Uh, El Salvador is going to open to us. The Lord told me that before I went there, that it would not be the only time I go to El Salvador, that we would be back. Um, the Lord also told me the nations would kind of roll out uh, and open before us. So we're seeing that not only in El Salvador, there's uh, invitations to go to Costa Rica, Colombia, Dominican Republic. Uh, I'm going to be working with the Sam translator again uh, seeing what we can do. But next time I want to take a team of opening it up to like 30 people. And so I'll need some team leaders, uh, probably two or three team leaders and uh, maybe two other preachers uh, that, you know, are starting. And I don't, I, I love to have everybody on the team, but what I want to have is people that want to learn how to move in the spirit of God, want to step out, want to bless the people, can flow in the prophetic, can pray for the sick, uh, we'll be training up people on every team and imparting into people so you can walk in the same kind of anointing, uh, seeing people healed because it's for all believers. I preach that everywhere I go for years and years that God has anointed each of us, not just the pastor, the evangelist, the prophet. Yes, we have the fivefold and the fivefold is to equip the saints. It's not for us to look high and mighty. It's not for us to look like we have all authority, all the power. It's for the equipping of the everyday believer, no matter if you're a housewife, a construction worker, a teacher, a gym coach, uh, just whatever walk of life you're in, the anointing is for you. The anointing, uh, Isaiah 61, 1 through 3, talks about the spirit of the Lord has anointed me and it says that we're to go out and proclaim the gospel, we're to heal the sick, we're to bind up the brokenhearted. And so that is every believer. And I've been preaching that for years, especially in Asia, like in China, when we preach that people, you know, who have been in communism, and then they come to Christ to realize that they're not just a part of one big society, but that they have an individual identity purpose and calling in Christ, it revolutionizes their life. And so we want to do the same thing with every believer, every person that comes on our team. So I don't know exactly which country we're going to yet. I'm looking at later this year, towards the end of the year. Uh, but if you're interested in that, start praying now about it, and we'll have details coming out, taking a team to Amsterdam, a small team to Amsterdam, uh, hopefully late August to minister in the red light district. So we're going to be heavy on soaking in the Lord and then going out specifically at night to reach people that are going to the clubs, they're going to do drugs, they're going to uh, the prostitution, the open prostitution there. It's just crazy. 
I mean, they've got like women that are almost naked in storefront windows and you just go in and pay to have sex with them, to have uh, sexual acts with them. Uh, and so, you know, people, it's just rampant right there in your face. Uh, and so we're going specifically to go into the red light district to prophesy, get words of knowledge for people. And so if you really want to go in there and see people like set free, you want to uh, witness to them, but you can flow in the gifts of the spirit and words of knowledge. Maybe you're not, you're kind of new to that, but we're going to go out there and hit them at the time they're coming out of the bars. Uh, the young people are out there and drove so many people. Uh, this is just a little quick thing on Amsterdam. So many people when we were there don't even believe in God. They believe that good works will get them to heaven. They don't believe there is a God. They said if they could uh, experience or encounter or feel God, they would believe. And so we want to go in there and we want to just, you know, be full of the spirit and give them words of knowledge because that's going to grab their heart. That's going to grab their attentions. They're going to say, how did you know that? And so, so many people that I met, no one I met when we were doing street ministry uh, in Amsterdam, when we were on our way back from the Ukraine and Romania, nobody was from Amsterdam that I talked to. They were either vacationing, working there temporarily, passing through. So it's a great harvest field to go into the red light district of Amsterdam. But anyway, so the crusade, uh, we saw, we had two salvations, you know, and there was more, I believe, and because they were broadcasting it in the park, I really felt like, you know, the numbers didn't matter who was in attendance, because what we were doing was staking a claim in El Salvador, and then not only were government officials there and some church pastors, uh, but we had a broadcast, like I said, we went on and uh, interviewed on the largest radio, Christian radio station in El Salvador, and it reaches 7 billion people in uh, Guatemala and some other countries, Honduras. And so I believe the impact of this crusade and when we preach the uncompromising gospel of Jesus Christ, not only was it for there in San Salvador, but it was going further than we could imagine, further than we can think. And I'm so thankful to God that the radio manager, the station manager just said, we're going to stop all our broadcasts Saturday night and we're going to we're going to stream live over the airways, the crusade so that people can hear what God is saying. They interviewed me before we went on stage saying, what is God saying to the people of El Salvador? So I believe that the impact of this crusade is going to be generations to come it's the start of something new it's breaking forth el salvador so that we can go forth in a greater way the next time we go because we're going to have more governmental backing and so um we had two salvations right there in the park and then uh we prayed for them to get filled with the holy spirit and then we had uh where we said anybody who wants a fresh touch a fire from the Lord. And when I gave a call, we had pastors that came up, uh, just regular people off the street, you know, that they were walking by and they heard the gospel message and they came, they wanted a touch from the Lord. And I gave a call for young people. We had a lot of young people in the park and I gave a call and I said, the Lord is calling you to ministry. Uh, and he want you know, he wants to fill you with his power and if you want to be used by God, come up. And out of all the young people in the park, we had one young man who was maybe like 14. He came up. And so uh, God gave me a prophetic word for him. And we prayed over him. We prayed over everybody that came up, even prayed over the anointing and the fire was so strong. The power of God was so strong in the altar area. And so we prayed over the team members. A lot of them got touched. Uh, Taryn got pinned to the ground and had an encounter with the Lord. And then, you know, it took several team members to get her to the van. Uh, but, she, you know, the team members were impacted and imparted to as well. Only God knows uh, with the fire. And so then uh, one of our team members, Steve, he was actually doing a Facebook live of the crusade and he got prayed for and went down. So I just went ahead and picked up his phone and then I saw, you know, several people on there and started just having words of knowledge 
and even uh, some prophetic words for people that were on the live. And so the music was really loud, but I was speaking uh, a little louder so they could hear. But just I know they were blessed by the words because the power and the anointing was moving so strong. I was able to even prophesy over people on the phone, be able to see people touched. And the fire and the power just kept increasing all week. Uh, it was something that, you know, it's new that I've stepped into this year and it's totally God's doing, but it's because I've been hungering and thirsting after the Lord, seeking him intimately, personally, Jesus, to have just an encounter and a relationship with him. And out of that has come this power, has come this authority, has come this fire. And I, you know, as we preach on Zoom in Pakistan, and as we do in all the church services we were in, I began to just pray and release the presence of God and release the fire of God. And the team began to move. And everywhere we went, we had people shaking and crying under the power of God. God was touching people mightily. And so if you sewed into this trip, thank you. If you prayed for us, thank you. Everybody watching the rebroadcast, thank you. Um, and so we were able to, you know, one more place we went was uh, on Saturday morning before the crusade. We went to a place called House of Values. And what that is, is in El Salvador, the president is a Christian. So he said that every mayor must have and establish a house of values, which is basically like an outreach outreach preventative center. It's, it's a bridge between the government and the churches. So the churches can go and get help. But we had a lot of pastors in attendance there. And so we just gave them a word of encouragement, a word of of uh, what God wants to do in El Salvador. They, you know, they were clapping, they were excited, they were hungry. So again, we just prayed and released the fire and the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And the team went out and I went out and we had people uh, falling out in the spirit, shaking, crying. Uh, and then Sunday was our last day. We did three church services. The first two were at the same church. They had two services, but the fire and the momentum kept building and so by the second service, uh, you know, when people came up to the altar, we were having, you know, still having strong words of knowledge, uh, prophetic words, but people were shaking under the power, crying, the fire was going. Taryn told me later that she thought the heater was on in the church. They had an AC unit, they had fans, they closed the side doors to keep the cool air in, and the back, uh, the the wall of the church was actually to the outside, but I was sweating and I could feel the fire. I could feel the power. And uh, Taryn said she felt like they had turned the heater on. And even from the first row in the church, you could feel the fire coming off the altar area. And so we prayed for everyone, gave prophetic word to the church uh, parents saw something, I saw something, it both aligned into one prophetic word about where God was taking this church. And then by the night service, uh, we had a worship leader that he sang at the crusade. He definitely anointed spirit led. Um, I even recorded voice recorded some of the music because there was such an anointing on it. And, uh, when we were in this last service, they had a pretty big attendance there, probably 100 plus people uh, for a Sunday night service. And the Lord, you know, I just sat down on the front row and I, um, I began to just say, Lord, what are you saying? You know, I just stopped myself from the worship and everything to just say, God, I'm getting into, Lord, what is your, what is your desire in the service? What are you saying? And it was like, there was like a cloudy mist around me. I was, I didn't see myself in this mist, like floating or whatever, but it was the glory of the Lord came upon me and where I had been having something in my heart, and my mind about what God wanted to say in that moment, God shifted everything and told me to go to Joe's, uh, Joshua. And when I went to Joshua, it had said, Moses has died. And it was time to get up and take the people into the promised land. Well, right before service, they were telling me that this church had been there 50 years. And four years ago, the father had passed away. And so as I began to speak out this prophetic word and read a little bit out of Joshua 1, I, you know, the Lord was showing me that they had walked uh, 
you know, and just as the Israelites, their shoes didn't wear out, they had food. So they had been taken care of and they were walking in good things, but that the well had been capped and God was going to uncap this well and the river was going to begin to flow again. And the things that they thought only the father, their father walked in, the husband walked in, were about to start flowing for this mother and the son. And it was a prophetic word from a church. And, uh, about how God wanted them to now enter into the new and into the promised land and behold the promise and not just maintain where they were, not just be satisfied where they were, but to go into the promised land and begin to walk in those things. And as as we spoke that word, there was a shift in the church as the church was saying yes and amen. There was a shift in what God was doing. And, uh, you know, the Lord even gave me a prophetic word for the son uh, just about his situation and how he put his life on hold to help with the church. But, you know, he has a strong music anointing. I told him in the church, he's going to have uh, a CD and I'm going to, I told him I want to buy one and that he's going to go internationally. Um, and just, and even a word for the mom, just about what she's been through and what the church has been through and how some people left and um, things that people said to her. And you can tell, like I said before, when it's a word from God and it's a prophetic word because it pierces their hearts. I mean, when I prophesied over the son, he was like broken, crying, weeping. And he just like, there was one moment when it just like really hit him and he just slumped to like the floor and he was just bawling as I was giving him this word. And then as you know, the mom, I gave her a word and she fell out. And then I prophesied over some different people. We saw demons cast out in church services. And so, you know, people, hey, Will, great to see Will Irvin on here. Irwin, uh, he's doing a great job in Texas building a church, uh, supporter of the ministry, done ministry with him, uh, street ministry. He's got a heart for the Lord. So it's great to see you on here, Will. And my mom, Linda Morgan, she's on here. Uh, you know, she's one of my biggest supporters. I love my mom. Uh, she helps me when we do ministry newsletters or thank you notes. She's helping me uh, do anything and everything. Always willing to help. Uh, I know she was praying uh, her and my sister as I was gone and all of you. And really, we had no problems. There could have been a lot of problems. Uh, a couple of team members got some stomach issues here and there. But overall, nobody was sick. Nobody had. There were times we had to break witchcraft off of people. I even had an attack. Uh, that came on me, uh, but prayed and it broke off. Um, just crazy stuff. But as we were praying at this last meeting, the the way the church was, the, the, the floor was like slanted towards the altar. And so the altar, because they had so many people in there, the altar wasn't huge. So we had to have four rotations in the altar to pray for all the people that wanted prayer. And at first they had told us, you know, we had to be over at 7.30 and then it was eight. And the pastor was just like, keep going, you know, because people were seeing other people get touched. Uh, you know, we had somebody delivered, uh, another person they wanted delivered, but they didn't, that person didn't want to be delivered. And, uh, but we had healings. There was a guy with a hearing aid in his left ear said he could barely hear and so I asked him if he was willing to take his hearing aid out and that we pray. Uh, and the music was really loud. And so he said, yes, we prayed for his ear, God opened his ear. And with the loud music playing, I whispered about this far from his ear. I whispered, amen. And he was able to repeat after me. And so God supernaturally miraculously just opened his ear. And then we had a lady bring her little baby in. The left ear on this baby was deformed. And so we just began to pray that, that God would begin to heal that ear. And even uh, without an eardrum, that God could do a creative miracle to give that baby an eardrum. But even if not, that that baby would still be able to hear, it, whether it had an eardrum or not, that it would be a notable miracle uh, that this baby would be able to hear. We had you know, other people in services healed of back problems. Uh, we had a lady that Sunday morning, I want to share some of these testimonies with you. Um, they're going in the newsletter, but we had a lady in the second service. Uh, power of God was all over her. She was just crying. 
the Lord was touching her. She got up and she explained about how for a long time, I think like two years, even she had been on medicine, like six months, one of her lungs was inflamed. And so she had trouble breathing. She had trouble like walking up and down stairs. Uh, she was on medication, but God healed her. She knew it without a shadow of a doubt because of the way she could breathe, how she could move. Um, she testified that God healed her. Um, we had another lady that said she had been bedridden and it sounded like fibromyalgia, whether she knew it or not, but she had pain all over her body. Uh, so much pain that she didn't even want to go to church that day. Uh, during the time of prayer, God touched her when we were praying for the sick from the stage. A lot of people, nobody laid hands on them. Prayer, and then when they came up, the team checked uh, to see if they were healed or if they needed more prayer. But she had pain all over her body, hadn't been able to bend her back. Her wrists were hurting. God supernaturally totally healed her completely. All pain left her body. I'm talking about, she said she was like an excruciating pain. All pain left her body. And that was Jesus touching his people. We had uh, another person with an eye problem, somebody with liver pain, been taking medicine uh, for years, said instantly he knew he was healed. Uh, backs were healed, knees were healed, wrists were healed, uh, vision problems, suicidal thoughts. Um, so we saw God do amazing things. One of the a guy that test, he was at the crusade. We had him testify. Uh, he had come to the church service on Thursday night and he was in the back and he had such pain in his chest and his back. Um, and the doctor had told him his kidneys weren't functioning and he got a really grim diagnosis and he, he went to church. He was in the back. He was sad. He was just crying. Uh, and he said, when we talked about coming up, if you need prayer, come in faith and Jesus will heal you. Jesus will meet your needs. He came up to the altar, guys, and he was just in anguish. I mean, crying uncontrollably, like desperation, like, God, you are the only one that can do this. And I laid hands on him without even knowing what was wrong, laid hands on him. He went down on the floor and God just began to heal him and touch him as he was laying on the floor. He got up and testified uh, and shared how the doctors had said his kidneys weren't working. He got a grim diagnosis. He had pain all through his chest, all through his back. But when we prayed, the sickness and disease broke off his life and he was all pain left his body and he knew he was healed. This guy was just crying and weeping and he was so happy and excited. And so when he, he was healed Thursday night and he went from looking like he was in such anguish to such like relief and thankfulness that when he came to the crusade uh, to testify Sunday night, he looked like a completely get different guy. He was in the audience and I had to ask my translator if that, that was the same guy that was healed the other night because he looked totally different. His face, his countenance totally changed. And so he gave up and came up and gave a testimony about how God touched him. And he told about his diagnosis, how long he had had it, what the problems were. And we just gave glory to Jesus for healing him. And we got a word for him that God was going to use him as an evangelist. And he would share his testimony and he would see many people won uh, to Christ in the days to come. So everywhere we went, we saw the power of God. We saw the healing and the miraculous go forth. And so I wanted to get on here and give you guys a trip update. Like I said, sorry, last week I was actually recovering. I was I was worn out from the trip, like physically and spiritually, just had needed a refreshing, needed to take some days to just uh, sleep and get in the presence of the Lord and refresh. And so I wanted to give you guys an update. This is Definitely not the last time we'll be going to El Salvador. We're looking at maybe going to Colombia later this year, taking a bigger team with us. So if you, if I said Colombia and something inside of you jumped and uh, you were excited, uh, you know, I don't know all the details yet, but we're in talks. We want to do a crusade there. We want to take a bigger team. Like I said, I'm looking at going up to 30 people for this team. God's grace will be there. We need team leaders. Uh, people that will be overseeing other people, uh, whether they have problems, 
uh, whether they have prayer needs, you're going to be also helping mentor them and how to pray for the sick, how to pray for people in the altar, how to move with the Holy Spirit. So I need some strong team leaders to come alongside on this trip, but it's going to be phenomenal. Guys, God is opening the doors for me, for the ministry, for you as partners to go into the other nations to preach the gospel. If you didn't hear, um, I'm going to Texas June 27th through July 7th. So if you want to meet with me, reach out to me uh, because the schedule gets busy and I need to leave time for my family. And we're going to go to Louisiana as well during that time. Then July 16th to August 1st, I'm going with Bernice Scheidler and Karen Yancey to South Korea. This is my first time to South Korea. We are so excited in anticipation how God will move in these meetings. Uh, the Koreans are hungry. They want prophecy. They want revelation. They want to go deep into the things of the Lord, into the spirit. And so they want us to move in revelation. So if you guys would be in prayer for us as we go, I'll give you more updates closer to that time. But just as God prepares us, uh, and we begin to fast and pray into what God's doing. Um, we we made it for two weeks because there was supposed to be a seven-day quarantine, but they just lifted the quarantine. So we're going to go keep the two-week schedule, go a little early, get some prayer and fasting in. So we're ready to minister, but we're doing two women's conferences in two different cities, and they're each two days. And so this is going to be an awesome time. We're super excited to see what God does. We know that the Koreans are hungry for a move of God. They're hungry for the word of God. They're hungry for revelation. So it's going to be an awesome time. First time in South Korea. So really excited about that. And then, like I said, into August, we're looking, we don't have all the details yet, but we're looking at taking a team uh, specifically to do street ministry in the red light district of Amsterdam, where we have the sexuality, a lot of spiritual perversion, open prostitution, basically, that's like business, uh, a lot of students, a lot of workers. Uh, we want to hit the streets at night, especially like after 8 p.m., hopefully to one or two in the morning, uh, because that's when the young people are roaming the streets. That's when they're out drinking. They're coming out of clubs and bars, and that's a great time to get in there and get like words of knowledge and prophesy over their life and speak destiny into their life. Uh, if you want to sow into that, if you want to sow into South Korea, uh, we would love for you to do that. I'm going to ask you to, uh, those that want on the trip that are watching, if you'll share this broadcast with your friends, with the family, with the people that sowed into your trip. I know Maritza wants to go back to uh, Amsterdam when we go in August. Um, you know, Katie Small wants to go, Her some of her family members. Uh, Dora wants to go. So some of you, uh, these people want to be going on these trips. So, so we have South Korea. Then the next month, uh, we have Amsterdam going into the red light district specifically. And then in September, I'll be here in Moravian Falls for the file or file. Fire Oil Glory Conference uh, with Charlie and Bryn Champ of Destiny Encounters. If you haven't been to one of these meetings, they're phenomenal. Uh, press into the spirit and the things of God. They have top rated speakers. I'm super excited. Alex Parkinson is going to be uh, one of the speakers this year. Alex is uh, a friend of mine. We've traveled uh, to Malawi together, to Benin. Uh, with Destiny Encounters, and he's actually, if he, I'm ordained through Renko, he's my overseer, but God's been doing great things through Alex, so I'm super excited about that, he's going to be speaking, and then like I said, later this year, we're looking at going into another country, uh, taking a team of 30, and it's going to be phenomenal, guys, God's opening so many phenomenal doors to the ministry, the power of God, and the season that I'm walking and stepping into, Thank you for those that have been praying as I've been pressing into God this year in a new and a fresh way, fasting, uh, seeking him, reading uh, books, watching videos, just wanting to go to a higher level and step into the destiny. As he's accelerating time, we're stepping into that Kairos time, not just the chronological time, but we're stepping into the God time and he's accelerating, he's doing new things. Hey, Jeremiah. I like the Jeremiah's on here. He's always sewing into missions, going on trips. Him and his family are very 
much into pursuing God and Sharon Hernandez watching all the way from Belize. Hey, Sharon, Brad, and Christy, and Mila. Um, so thank you for what you did. Thank you for sewing into this crusade. When it started, um, you know, it was the trip actually became, it was a plan and see trip kind of. And uh, we planned to take a small team and God just got a hold of this trip and just breathed on it. And the trip began to explode. And so for, uh, you know, a lot of times people plan crusades and trips a year in advance. But from start to finish, this was about maybe three, three to four months that it all came together. And so and then I was not going to do a crusade because we were raising money to do a Pakistan women's conference, which was phenomenal. We aimed at 400 people. We had 700. It was so powerful that it's opened doors uh, for us to go into Pakistan and do more. We were supposed to go in uh, May 2020 and it got canceled due to COVID. But the doors are opening even greater with what we can do on Zoom and have meetings and the power of God and the fire of God and the intensity in this season is just being seen as people are shaking under the power of God. They're being touched by the fire of God. I, you know, even now I still feel like the heat and the fan of God is just flaming on the inside of me. And so we, if you didn't hear about it, we prayed for people. We saw the fire of God explode in a fresh new way on the life, my life and the ministry. And it's just been powerful. If you want us to come uh, maybe to your country, you know, I would hope to at some point I can go to Belize even. And uh, there's so many places where we're wanting to take the fire and the power of Jesus Christ because it's time to ignite the church and set the church on fire. It's time to get the healing we need as Christians to go out and win the loss, to go out and minister to others, to be able to move in power because the young people and the people of the world are looking for the light and the power of Jesus Christ. And it's on the inside of us. And we have to get to a place where it manifests through us to touch our neighbors, to touch our cities, our region, our generation. And so God is wanting to raise up people that burn. And, um, you know, there's a quote and, uh, you know, that said, how do you, you know, you get all these people um, to come to your meetings? And I forget who the quote was by, but he says, I light my, I light myself on fire and the people come to watch me burn. And so that is my desire is that the Lord will set me on fire so I can set other people on fire. And um, actually, Jack Coe's daughter, Joanne Coe Herndon, was speaking uh, this past weekend at an event I got to go through, just got really refreshed, touched by the Lord, impartation. And she was talking the first night on Friday night about being a flame of fire, letting your fire burn. And I told the Lord, I was like, Lord, I want to set fire wherever I go. And she was talking about a little spark. And I, I kind of joked with myself and I was like, I could be called Sparky, you know, a spark of fire wherever I go. And when I went up for prayer, <laughs> this is God. He was, she was just like, okay, Sparky. <laughs> and I hadn't told anybody that, but she said it because God, God knew my desire is to be on fire, to burn, and then to light other people on fire in this generation for a now time and a now move of God to see revival sweep across our land, across our nation, across our generation. It's time to win the loss. It's time to take back territory from the devil. It's time to move in power. It's time to move in glory and it's time to move in strength. So I'm talking to each of you and I wanna encourage you. And I just wanna pray for you. If you'll share the broadcast with people because I know it's during the day and a lot of people are at work and you're gonna be catching this later. But I wanted to share everything that God did in El Salvador. And even as I feel the fire now, I'm going to pray for you that God will just impart fresh fire. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for every person under the sound of my voice. I thank you for a canopy of your glory resting upon each of them. Father, I thank you for a fresh release of your fire and your power. Father, I thank you right now you're beginning to touch them, that the Holy Spirit is touching them right now. Father, with fresh fire, I thank you that the power of God is moving through their body. I thank you that the name of Jesus is going and healing sickness and disease. Whatever they need, I command the spirit of infirmity to loose them right now in Jesus' name. I thank you that even cancer 
is being cursed and drying up at the root right now. I pray that I saw uh, Susan on here earlier. Susan, I pray in the name of Jesus that the fire of God right now would consume you, that every cancerous cell must die and be rejuvenated, that healing and strength would come into your body. I command cancer to go in the name of Jesus. It's a name that has to bow to the name above every name. So in the name of Jesus, we speak healing right now. And I speak the name of Jesus into Susan's body, that every cell of her body be renewed by the glory and the power of Jesus Christ. So if you need healing, I pray right now for eyes being open, eyes being healed and corrected. Lord, I thank you for hearing problems being released. Somebody in their left shoulder, I feel like you, you couldn't move your left shoulder. Begin to move your left shoulder. There's going to be a looseness. But Lord, I thank you. Even in your stomach, there's somebody that has like pain. I think it's a woman and you have pain in your lowest part of your stomach, almost down like where your hips are. So, Father, I thank you for healing right now, for kidneys in Jesus' name, that you begin to send your fire and your breath, Lord, that you would touch them in the name of Jesus. But, Lord, we release power right now to your people. It's time for your people to walk in power. So, Lord, I thank you for a new day and a new season and a new charge of power and the anointing. Father, that we release fire to be fire brands for you, that people that run with fire and would be contagious. Lord, they'd be like a uh, contagion, Lord, that infects, that flames, that sets on fire. Father, not only their household, not only their children and their spouses, Father, but their communities and their churches, Lord, that it's a fire that cannot be contained. And there's many of you watching, even Abby. Abby, I just feel this for you, that uh, even as you're watching, that when I said, um, contagion, that you would be somebody that would be contagiously burning for Jesus, that other people might look at you and think you look weird, think what you're doing is strange, but you don't care because you're going to burn for the Lord. You're going to do what the spirit of God is doing. You're going to move with the Lord in this hour. And that's what it takes. It takes breaking out of the mold, saying yes to Jesus and moving with him in this hour. Give you that little nugget there, but uh, I believe that we're coming into our finest hour. It's not just me. It's not just uh, big name preachers. It's every person in the body of Christ being empowered by the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 11 says that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives and quickens our mortal bodies. So God wants us to move in power with fresh wind, with fresh revelation, not stale bread. We got to let go of the old wineskin. We got to let go of the spirit of religion. We got to go let go of this is what God did in the past. You know, oh, if we could only go back. This is what God did when I was five. That's awesome. We honor everything that God did. But God is not in 1957 right now. The year is 2022. And we have to be moving in 2022 for us in the future generations, for those that will come behind us, that those that God is going to raise up. And so if you didn't hear all this broadcast, go back and listen, but share it with people because God wants to empower you to move in fullness. It's time to move into maturity. And uh, I've said it before that I want to do some uh, teachings, some short teachings and lives on uh how to move people into maturities, areas where you can move with the spirit of God, and then areas where we need to become mature in the body of Christ, because I love talking about the glory. I love talking about uh, the power of God, the healings, all those things get me excited, but I also am called to train people up to move in their gifting, to move in their calling, and it's time to move into maturity. We need to see the body of Christ move into fullness, and that includes men, women, and children. So to move into fullness, we have to begin to mature in the things of God. And then we're going to see our life change, our lives transformed, our family change. So I want to encourage you. Uh, I'm going to be doing some of these teachings coming up. Just anytime something hits my heart, I'm going to try to not, you know, make them shorter. So it's something you can listen to uh, within like five, 10 minutes, hopefully. And then you can uh, go about your day. But I thank you for joining me. I thank you for everybody that prayed, everybody that sewed. I know uh, I want to thank uh, 
uh, Gina Humpkins and Katie Small for leading the intercessory team here in Moravian Falls. And Charlie and Bryn Shant put us on their Destiny Encounters prayer shield. So all their partners were praying. And I know many of you were praying in your churches. I know uh, my Aunt Susie had her church praying. My sister Denise had uh, Dayspring Church praying. So there were many people praying. And it would, I, it's not because of my effort. It's because we said yes. We were willing to go, and it's because your prayers and you sowed that we were able to say, God, I'm going to step out on faith and believe for the finances to take a team, believe for the finances to do a crusade. And uh, it was, you know, it was a stretch of faith for me to believe to do this. And God met every single cent. Every single thing was paid in full because we're not going to do crusades and trips in debt. We're doing it all by faith. And it was because of your partnership and your giving that we were able to do this. And I want to thank you for blessing me, blessing the ministry, blessing the team. And together through partnership, and uh, we can change the world. We can touch the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if you want to be a partner, I'm going to put a link in the comment section and in the title, if I can, where you can go to the ministry website, see all that we're about, and that you can partner and that we can reach more people with the gospel of Christ. And we're going to more nations, more doors are opening. God is advancing us this year. We're growing beyond the capacity where I can do things myself. I've had to do all the accounting, all the uh, scheduling, all the planning. Uh, I do all the correspondence, but we're growing at such a rate this year at what God is doing as I move in obedience. And as I say yes to him, that we're growing beyond myself. So I'm gonna pull in some of my friends to kind of help me with some things uh, here in the office and with correspondence. Um, and we're gonna be working on, and we got the video of the trip working right now. I got somebody in El Salvador that's doing it. Uh, we're just editing a few things. And then I'm gonna be sending this video out, the trip video um and just blessing you guys but thank you so much thank you for partnering with the ministry thank you for praying for me praying for us and the team uh we could not do anything we do without you you guys are vital to what god is doing and i'm believing for new partners to come alongside and just join us on a monthly basis and i tell you you're going to be so blessed god's doing so much uh we the people that have joined in the ministry have had uh miraculous things happen, favor in their jobs, uh, increase in salary, positions created, uh, people coming out of debt, uh, supernatural debt cancellation, uh, just red tape and business that they haven't been able to get through. God's just done that. And it's through partnership and it's because of the blessing and the, the call of the ministry. And so if you're a partner, begin to expect breakthrough in your finances, breakthrough in your family, breakthrough in other areas, because you're in divine partnership and alignment with what God is doing. And so you should be blessed. And Terry, thanks for hanging out on the whole broadcast with us, going strong. Terry's a great guy. Terry, I hope to see you at Fire Oil and Glory here in Moravian Falls in September. Uh, awesome serving alongside of you. Got a great heart for the Lord, but thank you for joining me today. And uh, Terry, I, I just feel like God's going to do, uh, got so many good things for you. Um, I know you've been gone through some heartache and some different things, but I really feel like God is opening and breathing fresh life for a new season for you and to begin to expect good things, begin to expect God to breathe on your life and your situations in a new way. And so I just want to encourage you with that today. And um, just want to let you know, praying for you guys, love you guys, and thank you for everything that you're doing. And we'll talk to you later.